Hello. I am going to uh, give you your last lecture over the book thief. And I'm going to start on page 503. I want us to look at um, Michael Holtzfeld uh, killing himself and the significance of that. Um, there is a theme that Z Zuzak is developing throughout the novel. And um, he advances that even further by having Michael Hotspell kill himself. Um, how has he developed this theme throughout the novel? Well, first of all, the theme that this particular incident is um, highlighting is the survivor's guilt. The letter that Michael leaves behind suggests that his primary motive for his suicide uh, was survivor's guilt. He writes that he couldn't stand it any longer and hopes to meet his brother. The it that he is referring to in that letter most likely is the guilt that he feels for um, having survived when his brother did not. Um, and, and not only his brother, but so many others, you know, died. So um, Zuzak has been exploring this theme since one of the very earliest nights in the Huberman basement when um, Death explains that there is a story behind the accordion. So when we learn that story behind the accordion, we learn that Hans has some survivor's guilt. He explores that theme even further when we talk about Max and um, Max having survived when his family did not. Again, we explore this theme of survivor's guilt. For Max, the, um, the, the people that are able to survive with survivor's guilt find a way to do that. Um, so in Hans's case, his survivor's guilt became the motive for his heroic actions um, that he takes throughout the novel, uh, adopting little communist girls and um, feeding uh, the, the, the Jews bread and, and other um, heroic events that he um, takes part of in the novel. For Max, his guilt manifested itself in the bond between him and Liesel, and that eventually provided him with the strength to survive. Only Michael, who apparently could not find something positive to focus his energy on, to focus his guilt on, uh, he was not eased by life. Um, he eased his guilt for surviving by dying. So um, what we learn here is, oh, sorry, uh, what we learn here is, is that if we can find ways to work through our issues and to put our issues in um, a positive light, we have a better chance of survival. Um, Hans and Max were able to do that, um, but Michael was not. And so we can see through this particular um, section of the novel, the dire consequences of not being able to do that. Um, you can find that by reading 503 and 504. I want to go down now just a little bit further in the book. Uh, we see that Liesel is being um, whipped with a soldier's whip. Um, it is an episode that plays out in the way of the words. Um, what we find here is that Liesel is also experiencing the guilt that comes with surviving um, while those that she loves suffer. Now that she witnesses it firsthand, she cannot bear to see Max and the other Jews suffering, especially in the context that she herself has survived relatively unscathed. Walking with Rudy and accepting a beating for disobeying the soldiers does not do Max any practical good, but it allows Liesel to feel that she has at least offered some support for and has a solidarity with Max. So this way, she is suffering a punishment. And while we know it does not compare to the punishment that Max and his fellow Jews suffered, 
she feels now that they have an even deeper sense of camaraderie because they have both experienced um, the same whip. All right, and now I want to move way forward and talk about the end of the world part two. I want to talk about the emotional effect that Zuzak hopes to achieve in the end of the world part two when he reports death's thoughts uh, collecting the souls of the residents of Himmel Street. Um, by having death react emotionally, he is highlighting that death has more humanity than humanity does. Um, remember when uh, he described the bombs dropping, he called those planes tin cans, and he said that it just opened, the bellies opened. It was a non-feeling act. There wasn't um, any emotion in that. But by death expressing emotions, what he's expressing is he has got humanity that humans can't seem to um, grasp. Uh, completely. Um, whenever death expresses these emotions, when he has to take Rudy, he expresses his indignation at Rudy's having no one to comfort him in death. Zuzak is clearly trying to intensify the reader's sense of grief. He wants you to feel the grief that death is feeling. He does not want the reader to only know that the situation is sad. He wants us to experience the sorrow as ourselves because by experiencing these emotions, we come in touch with our humanity. So this is the purpose of the book. He is wanting the humans that read this book in order to prevent something like this from happening again, we have to get in touch with our humanity. And how do we do that? But through emotions. Emotions are what separates humans from other things, right? Um, from other creatures. So, uh, so it's very important to Zuzak and, and to um, the, for the purpose of this novel that we understand. Um, our humanity, that we get in touch with our humanity. And he does that here through the emotion of sorrow. As usually is the case with questions of evaluation. So whenever you have a question that says, what is the emotional effect of this um, in your standardized test or whatever, um, individual judgment is not as important as the reasoning behind your judgment. Okay, so when you see these kinds of questions on a standardized test or whatever, and um, you're asked to write an essay about what do you think the author's purpose was of this, getting the exact thing right isn't as important as being able to support your ideas with evidence from the text. We say often as teachers that our job is not to tell you what to think, but to teach you how to think. And this is one of the ways that we do that. So there are several supports for the claim uh, that Zuzak is um, trying to uh, uh, have us as the readers experience sorrow ourselves. Um, the idea that Zuzak is successful, you might could support this claim with death has taken over the story. So his feelings no longer constitute an interruption. His expressions of sorrow are now an intrinsic part of the story. Um, as narrator of Liesel's story, death has carefully foreshadowed the bombing of Himmel Street and the deaths of these people, especially Rudy. So his narration, narration and reactions now are the culmination of hints he has presented bit by bit through the novel. I've explained to my students that in metafiction, um, the foreshadowing, there's a lot of it, but it's not as um, hard to find as it might be in other genres. 
uh, in Metafiction, he says, let me offer you a glimpse, which is basically a big red flashing sign that says foreshadowing here. So he does that a lot throughout the novel. From the prologue onward, Death's narrative voice has been human. He sounds like we're talking to a friend. I've heard students say that before. He sounds like you're just listening to somebody's inner thoughts when the whole time this is death that's narrating. Um, by having death's narrated, narrative voice be human, he has expressed compassion for humanity at least as much as he expressed confusion. So while he does express compassion for humanity, he's also deeply confused by why humans do the things that they do. I'm confused too sometimes, huh? Um, in The End of the World Part 1, Death predicts that telling this part of the story will be difficult for him. He says, uh, Perhaps it's giving the reader a glimpse of the end to soften the blow for later or to better prepare myself for the telling. And in the novel, myself is even italicized. The reader can then accept the emotional tone of the narrative without being shocked or distracted. But you can also support the claim that Zuzak is not successful in um using these techniques to uh, raise the emotional level and the humanity level of the story. Um, some of those reasons could include that he's not successful would be death reactions are too predictable and suspect and expected. While Zuzak has foreshadowed this event and death reaction is uh, too often and death has a reaction to it too often, um, this account merely fills in the outline that has already been established. Another argument could be that the language is too forced or too contrived. Uh, when he says something like, then Rudy, oh Rudy, crucified Christ, Rudy, life's rug was snatched from under his sleeping feet. This is very dramatic language. That could be um, a reason why you're not able to um, attach to this scenario emotionally because the language he uses is too contrived. Um, maybe another reason to say that Zuzak isn't successful in this is that his tirade about Rudy's aloneness is too long and overplayed. Where was Rudy's comfort? Where was someone who was there? No one. These lines from the novel, again, these are overly worked lines that could actually serve the opposite effect in its readers. Instead of building emotion, it kind of builds this rolling eyes moment. And then also, as he has done several times in the novel, Zuzak tries too hard and pushes his effect beyond reader sympathy. So again, like I was saying, some of his words are so dramatic that we're not able to sympathize, to have sympathy with the characters the way we would like to. Instead, we are kind of eye rolling, much like we would at a soap opera or something. On page 539, if we'll look there, I want us to think about the significance of Liesl's remembering to take the accordion with her, but leaving her book. Now, remember, the, this book that she left is the book that saved her life. Earlier in the novel, it said she clung to the words that saved her life. These, this book has saved her life. It's, it's been expounded upon in that motif of the power of words. But here we have where she leaves her words behind, and instead, on page 539, she actually takes her accordion. On the last paragraph of 539, it says, later they remembered the accordion, but no one noticed the book. So what is the significance of Liesl remembering to take the accordion with her, but leaving her own book behind? At this point, the accordion represents just about everything Liesl recounted in her book. Her arrival on Hemistry, how Hans first started to forge their friendship, 
Hans World War I past and the favor that he owes Max's father. Max's arrival on Himmel Street and the means by which Max and Walter identified Hans and tested the man's willingness to help Max. Remember, he doesn't say, hello, I'm Max, when they get her in introduced. He says, do you still play the accordion? So that is what is significant about this, is that at this point, the accordion represents everything that uh, Liesl has recounted in her book. So while the power of words is still the central theme of the novel, she can now does not have to have that physical reminder of the power of words. Instead, what she actually needs is a tangible reminder of her time on Himmel Street because that time has now come to an end. All right, on page 543. I want us to talk about the significance about Liesl's dying while the sky is the best blue of the afternoon. From the beginning of the novel, the narrator has associated individual people's deaths with color. He says even in the very prologue, he says, first the colors, then the humans. Um, Liesl's brother's death had been white. The airplane pilot's death had been black. The death of the residents of the Himmel Street have been read, and Death also noted in one of his early highlighted asides that people observe the colors of a day only at the beginning and ends, but to me it's quite clear that a day merges through a multitude of shades and intonations. Death is simply telling us that the shade and intonation at the time Liesl died was a particularly lovely blue, which is one of Death's favorite colors, which means Liesl was one of his favorite people. All right, let's go. The last thing on page 550, which is the last page of the novel that I kind of want to draw your attention to, is Liesl on page 550 meets death because she's dying or is dead. And um, she asked him several questions, but the most important question she asked him here when she finds out that he has had this book all along, she says, could you understand it? Liesl's question itself is ambiguous. On the surface, she is asking whether Death was able to understand her writing. Um, but Death doesn't ever really answer Liesl's question. His admission that he has constantly overestimated and underestimated humans suggests that he did not understand the book. He recognizes the ambiguity. He says here, he says, I wanted to tell her many things. I wanted to tell her about beauty. I wanted to tell her about brutality. But then he admits that he does not understand how those things exist. He says, I wanted to ask her how the same thing could be so ugly and so glorious so damning and so brilliant. It is possible that Zuzak does not expect the reader to rationally understand the ambiguity either. We don't understand how life, how humanity can be so beautiful sometimes and so absolutely yucky, awful, gross sometimes. We don't understand that either. So it's one of those questions that we don't really expect death to have an answer to either. Postmodern thought rejected the idea of objective truth. Um, it questioned the very existence of an objective truth. The postmodern answer to Liesl's questions would have to be no, because it cannot be understood. In a last note from the narrator, what type of closure does Zuzak bring to this question? Well, in the last note, Death's admission is that he is haunted by people. In his prologue, he revealed that the book thief is only one of a large number of human stories he has collected, each of which is an attempt to prove that you and your human existence are worth it. That's a quote from the novel. Having examined, examined this story many times in the years since he first retrieved it, he has come to no conclusion, no closure. He does not know the value of human life. He cannot say one way or the other whether human existence is worth it. He is still haunted by us. He is still haunted by humans. And that is your last lecture.